welcome to the last lecture of this uh, week we will continue with our discussion on diverse approaches to design for sustainability so now we move on to the second level which is the product service system innovation level here the focus is beyond individual products towards integrating combination of products and services which means development of business models on how the product will be will reach people how will people pay for the product and so on so pss can be defined as a mix of tangible products tangible products which means products which you can touch feel so say a architectural space because you can be there that's a tangible product this mouse is also a tangible product your computer is a tangible product because you are touching them so it consists of a mix of tangible products and intangible services say for example the cellular data that you get on your mobile phone is an intangible service you cannot touch it so it consists of a mix of tangible products and intangible services designed and combined so that they are jointly capable of fulfilling a final customer's needs so pss are value propositions oriented to satisfy users through the deliver of delivery of functions instead of products so we will come to what does this mean through some examples in this category or in this level we have three approaches pss designed for eco efficiency pss designed for sustainability and pss designed for the bottom of the pyramid which we touched upon in our previous lecture so now to understand pss and the basic crux of pss let's go through some examples so does my customer need uh, washing machines or do they need clean clothes obviously we need clean clothes so our unit of satisfaction that is the functional unit over here is clean clothes it's not giving a washing machine so the product level intervention would always talk about making a better washing machine but the product service level intervention tries to understand what is that basic need which i am trying to fulfill and how through combining a product and a service i can bring that need fulfillment so in this case my basic need is clean clothes so this can be fulfilled by many different ways you can hire a person to clean your clothes at your home or you can take it your clothes to a laundry service you can also own a washing machine and clean it you can also go to a com community washing machine and get your clothes clean or maybe you can design new clothes which do not get dirty another example does my con uh, a customer need air conditioner so that's the product level of thinking that i need to build air conditioners but the pss level is no my customer does not need air conditioner my customer actually needs the actual unit of satisfaction here is thermal comfort you give it in any particular manner you can also give it through a proper architectural design you can also give it through say fans you can also mm, give it through central air conditioning rather than having one air conditioner which is placed in every room there can be many different ways of doing it does my customer need water purifier again no the customer does not need water purifier that's a product level approach my customer's actual unit of satisfaction is safe drinking water so when in our previous lecture we were discussing about the pyramidal servagel water atms what we were trying to say is Uh, because we took the pss approach which is product service approach i know that my customers requirement is safe drinking water so i figured out okay let me develop a product which is a community water dispenser let me bring in a service which is like pay per use so this is like an atm where you can swipe your card or you can put your coins or you can put in mm, currency notes and get water so pss system innovations they may act as business opportunities to facilitate the process of social and economic development in emerging and low income context so when we are talking about pss designed for the bottom of the pyramid what it helps to do is through a business opportunity it facilitates the process of socio economic development so now since the community has access to safe drinking water there will be lesser diseases there will be 
as a result lesser losses in work hours or kids will lose lesser number of hours from school because they do not fall sick anymore because of water so to facilitate the process of socio economic development in emerging and low income context by jumping over or bypassing the stage of individual consumption or ownership of mass produced goods so the product level intervention is individually every family or every person owns product but in this case what i am talking about because that level of consumption is the source of sustainability issue so why not by using this pss let's jump that towards a satisfaction based and low resource intensive advanced service economy this definition has been coined by united nations environmental program in 2002 so the pss model is shift from a consumption based on ownership you are still doing consumption but it's not based on ownership to a consumption based on access and sharing so i have access to clean drinking water even though i do not own it and i'm sharing the resource with everybody as a result lesser number of uh, those products needs to be produced and the machine which is produced will be used more efficiently more Uh, will be used for a larger part of the day than it would be if it was on an ownership basis in my own household another example so say solar water heating is very efficient but the initial cost of installation is very high again my need is not a solar water heater or a geyser based electric geyser based water heater my need is hot water so in case a company comes up with a model in which i do not need to own all these solar water heating unit it is still owned by the company it is serviced by the company what i do is i just pay per, for the hot water and not the unit so now it is in the interest of the company that they will come up with a very long lasting very efficient solar water heating system so that they do not have to spend much money on maintenance of it or on running of it so what do we learn from here is since manufacturer keeps the ownership of the product right now our way of consuming is once i buy the product the product belongs to me so the manufacturer's liability is very small they might have a warranty for one year they might have a service facility given to it but i always pay for that service so it does not give the manufacturer an incentive to build up build a very energy efficient or very long lasting product so in this case what we are talking about manufacturer keeps the ownership of the product and deliver a performance to customers when this customer delivery is happening the customer is only paying say for example for hot water not even for the energy consumption you heat water the way you want to i mean the manufacturer can heat with the water the way they want to since it's now manufacturer's responsibility the running cost of it the maintenance cost of it they are economically incentivized in reducing as much as possible the material and energy resources needed to provide that performance it was something similar to what we discussed with the kluber lubricant service because they came, so this is a concept this concept is called as pss design for eco efficiency where what it implies is an offer model so an offer model means a product service plus a business model so an offer model providing an integrated mix of products and services that are together able to fulfill a particular customer demand to deliver a unit of satisfaction based on innovative interactions between the stakeholders of the value production system so value production system is the satisfaction system so the manufacturer and a set of other stakeholders whom the manufacturer might have collaborated with to provide the servicing the maintenance and other activities so the stakeholder of the value proposition system where the economic and competitive interest of the providers so they all form the providers group providers continuously seeks environmentally beneficial new solutions so it's in the economic and competitive interest no longer an ethical value so whenever it becomes economic and competitive interest the mm, companies or the providers set of providers will obviously want to be more econ more environmentally sustainable so this can offer the possibility to find 
new strategic market opportunities for companies. So, the, uh, the Kluber experience or the solar water heating experience, they are new strategic market opportunities for companies. It increases their competitiveness because they are offering something more than what their other uh, competitors might be offering. For from if I need to buy lubricants from another company, I will have to spend more money. I will have to spend money in uh, doing my in-house lubricant maintenance, which now I do not have to do when I am taking the service from Kluber. So, it increases competitiveness, it establishes longer and stronger relationships with the customers which is quite obvious and builds up barriers to entry for potential new competitors. So, if a new competitor needs to come into the market, they have to build up the whole PSS model for themselves and build up a better PSS model for them to be successful in the market. So, hence the barrier to entry. Now, comes the third concept which is PSS design for sustainability. It refers to integrating in PSS design the socio-ethical dimension of sustainability. So, when we were talking about the PSS for um, eco-efficiency, we were talking about the economic interest in being environmentally friendly. So, we are still not talking about socio-ethical dimension. So, PSS design for sustainability adds another layer to the eco-efficiency um, definition. It says socio-ethical plus economic. So, how do we define it? The design of the system of products and services that are together able to fulfill a particular customer demand that is deliver a unit of satisfaction based on the design of innovative interactions of the stakeholders where the economic and competitive interest of the providers continuously seek both environmentally and socio-ethically beneficial new solutions. So, this same definition is applied to the PSS for base of the pyramid. So, you can see we could bring in socio-economic uh, benefit, we could bring both environmental and socio-ethical benefits to them. So, when it is up this particular principle is applied to base of the pyramid, it becomes PSS design for base of the pyramid. When it is applied to society at large, it is PSS design for sustainability. So, as you could see from the examples, it PSS design approach consists of product services and a network of actors who would together produce, deliver and manage the PSS. Also you can see it requires a systemic approach. So, that is why in this graph you can see as a whole the product service system has more systemic uh, components as compared to the product level. Now, let us put all these three PSS design approaches. So, as I told you PSS design for eco efficiency is the first layer which talks of design of product services propositions where the economic and competitive interest of the providers continuously seeks environmentally beneficial new solutions. PSS design for sustainability is the second layer. So, as above, but integrating also the socio ethical dimension of sustainability along with the environmental. PS design for bottom of the pyramid is um, uh, it includes both the um, uh, two layers. So, as above, but applied to base of the pyramid. So, if we try to see them on the graph on the left side, so you can see eco efficient product service uh, design lies somewhere here because we are still talking about technological development, but we are also ta talking about unit of satisfaction which is brought in by people. So, it goes little but higher up on this particular mm, graph because we need to involve more stakeholders. So, it is again somewhere in the middle between insular and systemic level. As soon as I bring in the PSS design for sustainability which also involves the socio ethical dimension. So, you can see sustainable product service. So, we are somewhere here. So, we include more of the people domain, we become more systemic. The product service system design for base of the pyramid lies somewhere over here. You can see it crosses between three sub levels. So, at the product level we discussed about it in the previous section, previous lecture. Now, we discussed about it in the uh, product service system level. Next, we will also discuss how it comes in the spatio social level. Higher it climbs, more involvement of the people domain and more it gets systemic. Also higher it goes in levels, 
the po potential for becoming more sustainable increases. Coming to the limitations for this uh, uh, particular approach, you will see all the four approaches that we discuss. each one of them have its own benefits and have their limitations. So, our solutions lies at how do we exploit the benefits and may optimize on the limitations by transgressing between the levels. The levels are not mm, hard defined, it is not like you cannot cross between levels, you can bring in features from 2, 3 or more levels. So, the major limitations are not all PSS result in environmentally beneficial solution. You have to build in environmental benefits otherwise uh, your, you might give a product and service system. So, your handset along with a mm, mobile mm, cellular data connection is also a product service system but it does not result in any kind of environmental benefit. PSS changes could generate unwanted environmental rebound effects. Say for example, increase in transportation. Say in the case of the mm, uh, water purifier, if the water purifier keeps on breaking down too often and the materials requ required for repairing them is not readily available my transportation cost of getting my service engineers, getting my service components might increase. So, when I am designing this PSS, I have to consider that uh, what all environmental rebound effects can happen and how through design I can optimize it. Then PSS especially in the B 2 C sector, B 2 C is business to consumer like the uh, water purifier that was a business to consumer are difficult to implement and brought to the mainstream because they challenge existing customer habits. Say for example, if people are used to spitting here and there, that water purifier will soon start getting looking very uh, dirty and then people might not like to get water from there. Say for example, what if people start washing their hands after having food in that water purifier, again that is going to become very dirty and it does not have a mechanism to the product is not built with a mechanism to digest all those food components. So, soon it will be a rotting place. So, mm, challenge existing customers habits. Also companies organization because now you have to collaborate with couple of other organizations build in new businesses which might be completely new for you. So, that might be a problem and also regulative frameworks because there might not be laws and regulations for your mm, kind of business model or the laws and regulations might mm, prevent you from implementing something of that sort in the market. Coming to the third level which is the spatio social level. Here the context of innovation is on human settlements and the spatio social conditions of their communities. What do we mean by spatio social conditions? Say for example, a community living in a desert area will have a very different kind of space which is hot, dry, full of sand. Another place like a hilly area will have a very different spatial characteristic. They might be on the top of the hill, they might be on the um, foot of the hill, their water situation uh, at the top of the hill you also have deficit of water because all the rainfall which happens it uh, goes uh, downhill. You have a higher amount of uh, soil erosion, there is certain transportation related issues because of the hilly terrain. So, in spatio social innovation level, we are talking about how the space and the social uh, conditions of the people living over there, how do we innovate in those contexts considering the human settlement. So, this can be addressed on different scales, this can be from one small neighborhood to as large as cities, districts and so on. So, design it has two mm, types of uh, uh, approaches design for social innovation and systemic design. This might be very surprising that systemic design is lying so close to the technology domain it hardly has anything to do with the people. Whereas, the other which is designed for sustainable social innovation that fairly involves the people domain but it does not involve much of the technology domain, it goes very far away from the technology domain. So, let us see what do they mean. So, do design for social innovation. 
so the focus here is assisting with conception development and scaling up of social innovation now what is social innovation so there are different interpretations and perspectives on what social innovation is also what role design can play in social innovation processes so technological first let's understand what technological innovation is and then go to what social innovation is and continue further so technological innovations are assumed to be radical aiming for technological paradigm shifts they generally target environmental problems and are mainly pulled by government policies which means the government might set norms that your product should not release more than this amount of uh, smoke or your product should not consume more than this amount of energy and pushed by emerging and enabling technologies so new technologies might come in that can also push the environmental paradigm shift which might be independent of our political uh, government policies now what is social innovation it refers to those innovations aiming to solve say social problems like poverty access to safe drinking water and so on or those targeting behavioral change and social well being or as a creative recombination of existing assets and avoids a technocentric framing what this one means is whatever knowledge or whatever infrastructure or whatever facilities you have at this moment which is your existing assets recombine them with a, uh, and avoid a technocentric mm, uh, framing so recombine them in order to solve certain social problems so you can see there are many different interpretations of social innovations say for example like i told you in the social innovation category there is hardly much technological innovation it's only about, in this particular domain is talking only about social innovation so we use existing uh, technology so this is one example uh, in this case a neighborhood people in a neighborhood can join hands and help each other the help can be of different types depending on what someone might need at that particular time so there is always a number so anybody could call in that number and get help from people in the same neighborhood so this is purely a social innovation it can work by the existing mechanism of phone it can also be an in person and it can also be an online sign up version so not much technological innovation purely a social innovation where benefit of the society of that neighborhood so everybody tries to bring in uh, benefit to each other which is like social well being through security through helping each other so this is an example of social innovation so in social innovation a key role is played by people and communities creative communities is commonly used term to indicate that social innovations usually emerge from the inventiveness cre and creativity of ordinary people and communities so sometimes these collaborations can also be with grassroots technicians and entrepreneurs between local institutions between civic society organizations and so on these are ordinary people and communities so according to manzini it is defi uh, defined as design for social innovation now we are designers so we need to understand what is design for social innovations from this previous uh, description you can clearly see that a key role is being played by people and communities so not necessarily social innovation comes from the side of a designer mostly it comes uh, from the uh, interplay between the people communities and these are ordinary people and communities but now as designers if we have to use this method to uh, design uh, social innovations to design for sustainability what should it imply so manzini defines design for social innovation as a constellation of design initiatives geared towards making social innovation more probable it's very difficult to guarantee that social innovation will happen even if you did all the things right it people might not accept it so that's why i'm saying making social innovation more probable effective so whether it could bring in some kind of social benefit or not whether it could achieve sustainability or not so that is part of effective 
then very importantly long lasting. Some initiatives must just die out within a very short, short span of time. And how apt it is to spread. So, it happened in one neighborhood, can it be replicated to another neighborhood. So, design for social innovation is all design initiatives which can be geared towards making social innovation more probable, effective, long lasting and apt to spread. And points out that it can be part of top down approach also. So, what is a top down approach when it is driven by experts or decision makers and political activists. So, the community or the people did not really uh, initiate the process, but it was more driven initiated by the top level which is like experts here, the designer can be one of the expert decision makers and political activists or it can be bottom up where it is driven by local communities or it can be a combination of both of these approaches. The limitations of this approach is like you say so the de uh, definition itself of how design can play over here it clearly shows that it is very difficult for a designer who might be an outsider to a particular community to come in and make any effective social innovation or long lasting social innovation. Most examples of social innovations have actually been driven by the local communities. So, thus the criticism arises from that, that many a times when designers design it and not many design curricula exist which will train designers to do this, the designers are very naive in proposing superficial solutions and also the designers are very costly. Then a sole focus on social innovation is not likely to achieve the levels of change required in large socio technical systems meeting society's energy, mobility or housing infrastructure needs. Why? Because you need technological innovations as well along with it. We will discuss more about this aspect. So, when social innovation is combined with technological innovation which is my next level which is the socio technical level of innovation. How we overcome this second limitation because we bring in social plus technological together, but we have more uh, problems added on because the picture becomes just too big and the time frame required for doing such activities becomes too long. Coming to the second approach in this particular uh, level is called as systemic design. Its focus is on designing locally based productive systems in which waste from one productive process becomes input to other processes. You might find it very similar to our mm, uh, cradle to cradle definition or the biomimicry kind of a process. So, yes systemic design is another nature inspired approach, but it is different from the cradle to cradle or biomimicry approach because it focuses on the third level of biomimicry. If you remember we were talking that biomimicry can be done at three levels, the form level, the process level and the ecosystem level. So, in systemic design we are talking about the mimicking nat natural ecosystems. So, for example, Polytechnic of uh, Turin in collaboration with Lavaza came up with a solution. Uh, so, they implemented a solution to reuse coffee waste as an input for agricultural production. You heard about this even in the blue economy uh, case study that we discussed. So, a new productive and value chain was put in place by which coffee waste can be used in three stages as a source of lipids and waxes for pharmaceutical production, as a substrate for farming mushrooms and as a medium to grow worms for vermicompost. The systemic design approach seeks to create not just industrial products, but a complex industrial system. So, you can see in this particular uh, solution, the agricultural production was combined with the industrial production, in which a complex ecosystem was uh, created with three different uh, processes in which this coffee waste can be integrated. So, it aims to implement sustainable productive systems in which material and energy flows are designed so that waste from one productive process becomes input to the other process, preventing waste from being released into the environment. So, it is a very territorial approach because one region might be very different in terms of geography, in terms of agricultural production, in terms of 
industries that can be set in terms of uh, climatic conditions and so on. So, this is a very territorial approach. It looks at socio-economic actors, the assets and the resources available with the aim of creating a synergistic linkage among productive processes that is agricultural and industrial, natural processes and the surrounding territory. The limitations of this is the approach is mainly fo focused on the production aspect as was the limitation of uh, the um, uh, cradle to cradle or biomimicry. It does not issues of reducing individual consumption. So, comes all the limitations of cradle to cradle approach like we discussed in our previous class. So, problems related to the fact that if you produ uh, produce uh, infinite amount of waste that does not mean the ecology can absorb all that at uh, after at high concentrations it becomes damaging to the uh, human uh, beings. Also, you cannot uh, recycle anything 100 percent even if you are able to recycle 100 percent the quality is no longer 100 percent and in order to keep up with the increasing consumption we have to keep on adding more and more uh, virgin material to it to meet up those consumptions. Thirdly, there is no consideration for the energy or other material consumption which will happen during the use phase because the consumption is not considered. So, these are the limitations. Now, putting them back into the map, so you can see design for social innovation is way high up here. It does involve people, it is also systemic in nature to a great extent, but it does not involve technology. So, it cannot really solve n, bigger challenges of a society like n, uh, energy requirements, transportation and so on. It talks about reorganizing the current assets and how do we use them to get the desired results. Then coming to the systemic design, it lies somewhere over here. It again does not involve the people domain because it is not considering consumption what it is talking about is technology, te pure technological development, but it is very territorial in nature that is why it lies at the spatial level. It also depends on the agricultural activities of the people and other allied businesses of the people that is why it falls in the spatial social level. It is because it involves uh, the collaboration of many different types of stakeholders uh, in the whole system that is why it is very systemic in nature. Now, coming to the final uh, innovation level which is the socio-technical system innovation level. Here design opportunities are focusing on promoting radical changes on how societal needs such as nutrition and transport uh, mobility are fulfilled and thus on supporting transitions to new socio-technical system. So, it involves both social innovation and technical innovation. So, the fo uh, focus is on transformation of socio-technical systems through strategic design. So, in our one of the previous classes, we discussed about the Varnapura. That is an excellent example of a socio-technical uh, innovation. We will again go through this particular video. Why? Because Understanding socio-technical innovation, the length and the effort is very difficult in actual context. Many a times it is not one person, but it is the involvement of many people, the many visionaries who bring in such uh, changes. So, we will go through it again and then we will try to discuss socio-technical uh, innovation level again.
the end of British Raj brought many new freedoms and opportunities for the farmers. Traditionally, the farmers always processed whatever little cane they had into jaggery. If instead cane was made into sugar, it would add value and earn more. But the farmers had no means to set up a sugar factory. That's when Vishwanath Rao Kore hit upon an idea. What if the farmers formed a cooperative? Convincing the farmers to be members, telling them of his vision of Warana Valley was not an easy job. But convince he did. He saw strength and togetherness, prosperity and cooperation. Finally, Tatya Sahib, as Vishwanath Rao was by now called, began a cooperative movement for sugarcane farmers. The Warana Cooperative Sugar Factory was set up. This brought dynamism to the once slumberous and arid Warana Valley. Eighty determined villagers, led by Tatya Sahib Kore, crossed all hurdles with perseverance and confidence. The sugar factory grew in size and soon had the largest cane crushing capacity in India. Along with the sugar factory, the farmers of the Warana Cooperative built five dams. The dams improved irrigation facilities and the yield of sugar cane rose dramatically. Sugar brought prosperity and it gave the farmers and their families a new lease of life. Finally, Tatya Saib Gore's dream of a farmer's cooperative was realized. To improve the economic condition of landless laborers of the Warana Valley, Warana Dairy was started as an on-the-side enterprise of the cooperative. The Warana Bank was founded to help the cooperative with financing new ventures. The cooperative bank provided loans necessary for cattle purchasing, etc. The side business flourished and grew rapidly. Today, it is a state-of-the-art milk collecting and processing plant with 3 lakh litres daily capacity. The Warana Cooperative diversified by setting up modern manufacturing units to produce milk products like Shrikhan, Ghee, Skim Milk Powder, Masi, Cheese and Butter. Today, its Shrikhan and Lassi are market leaders. The women of Warana Valley joined hands to form Warana Bhagini Munda and contributed to the revolution. They emancipated themselves from the drudgery of household work. Tatya Saib Gore's vision was to achieve a revolution, economic and intellectual. Thus, Warana Vibhag Shikshan Munda was born. Schools and colleges both in humanities and sciences were set up. Tatya Sahib's battles against poverty and illiteracy were slowly and surely won. The famous Baal Vatya friend became the voice of Varana Valley world over. Tatya Sahib Gore Military Academy was founded with the objective of nurturing young boys to become efficient soldiers and citizens of the nation. Men, women and children all have been transformed by it. There was no looking back after that. Other ideas followed. The Warana Cooperative Poultry Farm, an example of a rural enterprise turning even more profitable as a cooperative venture. The Warana Bazaar, chained with branches in all the villages of the cooperative. Bagas, the waste from the sugar factory, was used as raw material to manufacture paper. Warana Distillery, which uses molasses, a byproduct of sugar, to manufacture industrial alcohol. Warga Agricultural Research Center devising environmentally friendly techniques for better farming. Mahatma Gandhi Hospital, enabling the villagers to easily access the best in health care. The picture of Varana Valley that Tatya Saib Kore had envisioned was a reality for all to see and be inspired by. The vision of Tatya Saib was inherited by his son, Sri Vilas Tata Kore, who envisioned the advent of agro-technologies. His son, the equally dynamic Vinay Gore, Saukar to all in Warana Valley, is carrying forward this vision. Our mission is to enable every man in Warana Valley to take control of his destiny. The need of the hour is to amalgamate the goodness and strength of our traditional Indian values and technological achievements of the 21st century. We are determined for the upliftment of every individual.
individual through the Warner Cooperative Movement. Today, in Warner Valley, a revolutionary concept is shaping up. The Warner Wired Village Project, where all the 80 villages will be connected by their own net. A pilot project of the government being implemented here in Warananagar. Webcos, a state-of-the-art fruit processing factory, was set up with American Loans and Technology. Clearly, the Warana Farmers' Word of Honor is good enough mortgage for international funds too. In Warananagar, every process is integrated, interconnected, interdependent, and completely independent of outside assistance. The new generations in Warananagar do not toy without rewards. Every farmer in these 80 villages is a shareholder in the hugely successful cooperative story. From this particular example, what you can see is in a socio-technical innovation uh, level, what we are talking about influencing technological innovations, social innovations, institutional innovations. So all those uh, cooperative banks, uh, engineering colleges, processing units, they are institutional innovations and organizational innovations like how all these are organized with each other, how the interconnections happen. So it influences it at all these four levels. You can see more examples of this on our lab's website. Our lab is called as Sustainability and Social Innovation Lab. There are many such examples of these kind. But there is a big challenge, all the examples that you can see because of the magnitude of impact, because of the magnitude of activities which need to be done. The biggest problem is it's too big a picture and need to be supported by approaches that focus on development of products and services that can be part of a new socio-technical system. So it, uh, size of the whole thing is, a, is its biggest challenge as well as limitation. So if we try to put this into our map, so you can see this is where our design for system innovation and transition lies. So it does cover up the spatio-social level as well as the socio-technical level. It has to because the concepts cannot be away from spatio-social. Since we are talking about both people as well as technology, so you can see the whole size of it covers everything, all these aspects. Also it is very, very systemic nature. It cannot exist if it is insular, it has to be very systemic. Also its potential for sustainability is very high, depends on how you organize it. But its sustainability is again a long run, uh, testing its sustainability, checking with how sustainable is a long run process. Summary. So, we learned that we can categorize the innovation levels at four levels, the product innovation level, the product service innovation level, the spatio-social innovation level and finally, the socio-technical system innovation level. Sustainability as a concept is not a static goal. It is a very dynamic goal and it we keep on responding to our, we keep on changing our target, we keep on responding to it depending with our increasing understanding of interdependencies between social and ecological systems. Sustainability is also a system property and not a property of individual elements of a system. So a glass of water is not sustainable because it is an individual element. Only when I put it into an entire system, it can be sustainable or not sustainable. So therefore, achieving sustainability requires a process based multi scale and systemic approach to planning for sustainability guided by a target or vision. Approaches solely aiming to generate technological solutions for sustainability problems tend to generate only techno fixes. 
these techno fixes does solve the problem at a given instance of time but they uh, transfer the problem from uh, a to b and this b comes in another point of time on the other hand a sole focus on social innovation is not likely to achieve the levels of change required in large socio technical systems meeting societies energy mobility housing or infrastructure needs hence we need to combine both these approaches and come up with feasible and viable solutions so this particular framework it helps to visualize the linkages overlaps and complementarities between different dfs approaches in our course we will be talking mostly about the product service system level and eco design and then how do we combine them together the other levels we will be very likely touching upon them because of the complexities involved in design for them so the reading material remains same as it has been for the whole week in the next week we will take one example and try to see relationship between the approach of design for sustainability that we take and the application context thereafter in the next week we will start with life cycle assessment and how to design for life cycle assessment which is the eco design part of it thank you